G'day guys and welcome, my name's Michael and I am the Dead Aussie Gamer, here to share with you a very special review of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Now, before I get too stuck into it, I want to share with you guys a little bit of context so you can understand where I'm coming from for this video. Now, if you've watched my channel for a while, you would understand that I love Pathfinder 1st Edition, and I've loved it for many years. Uh, most of my games that I run are in the Pathfinder world of Galarian, I own most of the hard copy books, and anytime I try to teach someone how to roleplay, I will more often than not use Pathfinder 1st Edition. When 2nd Edition was announced as not being backwards compatible, I I was really sad, you know? it. It actually really affected me very deeply, and I, I almost grieved in a way uh, when the announcement was made. And I, I established a very strong bias against second edition Pathfinder. A admittedly, I, I've seen the error of my ways. Once I got to Gen Con this year, I actually got to meet some really awesome people who were very much into Pathfinder Second Ed, and they ran a couple of demo games for me. Not only did I get to see how good the game was, but also got to enjoy the character building process. And I think, even though it's a different game, a lot of the spirit of Pathfinder still remains in Second Ed. And uh, that's pretty much what the focus is going to be. We're going to be talking about that, we're going to be saying some of the cool stuff, some of the bad stuff, you know, we're going to be talking, chat, very relaxed. So, let's get into it and let's talk about my thoughts on Pathfinder 2nd Ed. So, first of all, it is a D20 system. And a lot of people say, oh, well, of course it's a D20 system. But you know what? I'm viewing it from new eyes. It being a D20 system means that it respects a lot of the people who have played in those types of games before. It's going to mean it's easy for them to get into this game without necessarily having to relearn a whole bunch of new rules. The great thing is, is it also means that new players who, uh, who adopt Second Ed, who go into it for the first time, will also have the skills necessary to play any other D20 game. For me, this level of accessibility is just a good sign. It shows a very strong attitude and a solid foundation for any game to be built on. I think there are a number of things that make Pathfinder unique, even though it does use a very familiar mechanic. And these uniquenesses, I think, are what make it very cool. Uh, the first is the combat system. I think the combat system is the, probably the most spoken about aspect of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, leading of course with the fact that there are three actions and one reaction in the action economy for combat. What this means is that there is a more dynamic style of combat. You're now no longer restricted to the two actions that many games follow, and you can actually start doing some really cool and fun things. Movement, for example, is one of those aspects of cinematic combat that is underappreciated. We don't do it because, well, it eats up half of our turn. With three actions being in tow, it means that you can do really cool stuff, like running across a wall and leaping onto a wagon, then firing an arrow at the driver to try and stop the wagon. It means that you can start doing things like, um, you know, running into combat, into melee, grabbing uh, a small tome uh, from the belt pouch of the bad guy and then trying to run away. These more cinematic styles of battle and combat, I think are going to open up an entirely new style of roleplay battle. And I think that's going to be something to very much look forward to. Uh, another aspect of combat that I think is very, very cool is how they, they're handling critical hits. Naturally, we've always been a fan in D20 systems of the natural 1 and natural 20 confirming or denying, oh, confirming a critical hit or a critical fumble. In Pathfinder 2nd Edition, it is not just limited to the natural 20 and the natural 1. If you exceed or fail a check by 10 or more, you also trigger critical effects. And that is kind of cool, because it means that there is now a definitive difference if you even attempt something that is well beyond your means. I like that because it means that, uh, you know, you don't need to necessarily go up against weak minions and have to sit there and hope that they don't roll natural 20s you will always be rolling really high, and you will crit on every other hit if you're fighting something incredibly weak. Alternatively, you will constantly fumble if you try to take on something incredibly powerful. This level of danger and level of um, power curve is going to make a massive difference uh, when it comes to deciding uh, what is worth fighting and what is not. Uh, and actually, that'll go into the next cool thing, which is after combat. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up again in a minute. So bear that in mind, the whole critical hit thing. The last aspect of combat I think that is very, very cool is the spell casting. 
Spellcasting has always been, in my opinion, something that has always cost a lot more than you've gained from it. You know, it's one of those things, you're in a weak body that is very, you know, kind of, it's really hard pressed to play someone frontline who is a spellcaster, for example. Uh, you take a lot of penalties and the powers that you get can sometimes become outpaced very quickly. If you have a low level spell, by the time you're level 10 or 20, uh, yeah, you don't have any use for it anymore. Pathfinder has uh, allowed for heightened spells to be a thing now. So even if you've got a low level spell, you can heighten that spell by using a higher spell slot, gaining not only more effects, but a higher challenge for other people to try and overcome. This is going to definitely open up the spell book to being more than the last three levels of spell your character learnt, to now being an entire spell book. So that is exciting and that is fantastic. And if you're not a spellcaster, don't worry, because of course, classes have focus spells. Things that are unique to the class themselves and available to those classes. They use an entirely different point system called focus points and allow players to be able to dip into spellcasting without necessarily making a spellcaster. So yeah, very, very cool and very excited about that. So that's, that's combat. Combat is a very, very exciting thing, and I think um, I think there's a lot of potential for the characters in the game to really start some very dynamic forms of roleplay. Uh, the next cool thing I think that they've uh, really kind of brought into the core mechanic is the idea of the way they're running skills. Now, proficiency is not a new term. It's something that we've seen in other roleplaying games before. It is where you add your level to any skill or ability that applies your proficiency bonus. So if you are trained in a skill, you applied your proficiency bonus. If you're trained in a weapon or armor, you apply your proficiency bonus. But that's not where it stops. I mean, that in itself is not unique. It's not special. It, it's like, yeah, whatever. But the way they actually level it out is that you can keep enhancing your training. And by enhancing your training, you open and unlock more challenges for you to be able to make. You start untrained, where you don't apply your bonus. You have Train, which you apply your proficiency bonus, Expert, Mastery, and Legendary, where you then get a bonus, like a very tiny bonus, on top of that, as well as the ability to utilize your skill in more high-stakes scenarios. What does that all mean? Let me give you an example. Let's say that there is a king on his throne, surrounded by guards in his courthouse. You are a rogue who needs to stealth up to him and steal the crown from off his head. Now, in the days of previous editions, you would simply roll that check. Roll the stealth check and see how you get. And you could roll a natural 20, which is not an automatic uh, uh, critical hit or not an automatic success. And I want to point that out. Um, but you could have tons and tons of static bonuses. Plus two from this, plus four from that. You're small, so here's another bonus. And here's another bonus for that. And this, that, and the other. And you could math your way to a success. However... There is new power now because a GM can look at that scenario and go, well, actually, you need to be a master stealth expert or well, a master stealth person uh, before you can even make that role. If you are not a master, you will automatically fail. This kind of cre creates a bit of contention, I think, between players and the GM, but it's really good because it means that you have more control over your narrative as a game master. And it means that your players are now encouraged to train and expand on those skills rather than to simply arbitrarily throw numbers at you. I like this as a fact. I like this as a skill. And I think it's one of those things that I'm going to be the most excited to play with. Because, well, let's be frank. Uh, how many of you guys have played characters or played in games with characters who have just made a knowledge check and kind of ruined the surprise of the identity of a monster or the special ability of a monster? It, it's one of those things. It's like, well, no. Why would your character know about the secret treasure of El Dorado? I mean, I guess, I, you know, with a 50 on your skill, I'll give you the map. You know, now you can just go, well, no. You need legendary knowledges to, uh, to, to know where the uh, lost treasure of El Dorado is. Or, uh, no, you need an actual um, expert rank to be able to pick this lock because it is protecting a safe, you know. This, that, and the other, this all contributes to what I think is going to make for a very balanced and very intricate game. That is very elegant as well. Um, so, yeah, those are the, the main aspects I thought were the coolest in the game. One thing that I thought might pose a challenge in Pathfinder 2nd Ed was actually the thing I was really excited about. 
character options are a huge part of Pathfinder, and it should always be a huge part of uh, Pathfinder. However, I think they may have stepped a little too far, and there's a danger that it's going to turn into a double-edged sword later down the track. Rather than simply having classes or abilities that have static bonuses and archetypes which interchange them, like Pathfinder did, 2nd edition has variations that occur at certain levels. You reach a certain level and it's like, a, oh, here is a list of stuff that you can take now at this level. These things work like feats, they have prerequisites that you need to meet, and you can select them at, at will. Whatever you want, you can throw them in. I like this. I like this as a fact. I like this as a style. But I think that over time, that pool of skills and abilities is going to start expanding and tie that together with general feats, skill feats, class feats, and even ancestry feats. I think eventually, without a good SRD like Archives of, Archives of Nethys, um, you could see there's going to be a rules glut, perhaps, on the horizon. Uh, that's kind of my only like, really naysay about the character creation, though. Uh, it's actually a really fun and simple way to build characters, and I've had no problems making a, a slew of characters now. Uh, it's really exciting to see the goblins become a playable uh, character now, because of course uh, goblins and Pathfinder are so iconic. I am actually going to think to myself like, wow, every table I'm going to have is going to have a goblin if I play second ed. I guarantee that's going to be the case, because pretty much my first ed game is more or less the same. Uh, so, so yeah, there's that. Um, I suppose on the topic of uh, ancestry as well, I've always been a fan of ancestries and races rather rather than sort of it being an interchangeable thing, being a static thing, you know? Like, this is your standard dwarf. Here are some variations, and when put together, you have a mountain dwarf. But this is a mountain dwarf. This is a hill dwarf. This is a coastal dwarf, etc., etc., etc. I The way that it's built as you level up and you gain the ancestry feats... I think it waters down that uniqueness that comes from being a particular breed of a race. I mean, maybe that was the intention. Maybe it was an idea that hereditary powers shouldn't be a thing. Whatever it was, it's not my favorite, but I accept it as a, um, you know, I accept it as a truth. It, it's, it's fine. It allows for a lot of character, op uh, character options, but, you know, I suppose some people will love it and others won't. There you go. Um, all right, and of course classes. We also see a new class in the form of the alchemist, which is, uh, sorry, a new core class, I suppose. The alchemist is a very familiar thing from Pathfinder. It is by far my favorite class, and the fact that I get, get to play one now as a core one is just very, very exciting. I was always really worried in, in a part that Paizo did not like the, uh, the alchemist, but it's really nice to see them get, getting a lot of love, and with any luck with them at the ground level being a core class, we'll get to see a bunch of really awesome options as the game develops and matures. So yeah, yeah, very keen on that. The Probably the most happy I am for the classes is the fact that the paladin is no longer there. Uh, I know what people are thinking, what do you mean no paladin? They've changed the paladin. Instead of the paladin, you now have the champion, which represents the warrior of any different type of god. Not just the lawful good ones, but anyone. And for me, that just shows such a uh, such a, 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 a pursuit of that 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 desire for for new, for for the exciting push forward. You know, it it, it sucks when tradition kind of keeps us bogged into these tropes. Paladins need to be lawful good. Paladins need to be this. I'm going to tell you how to role play. The champion does not do that. The champion says, here is your direction. You wish to be a champion of a god? Fantastic. Pick your god. Be a champion of them. Here are your values and tenets. Do them how you would, but as long as you follow those tenets, as long as you follow those values, you will be a champion of that god. That, that has me very excited. Um, you know, I was never, ever excited to play a paladin. Uh, I still, till this day, am never excited by paladins. I am, however, very excited for the champion, and I cannot wait to play one. Um, now, in terms of, like, the whole building process, I found the building process very easy. Um, the only criticism I would have is the character sheet. A lot of people are saying the character sheet is a bit cluttered, and I would have to agree. I think it is very efficient. It gets as much stuff as in the game into the actual sheets themselves, but, you know, it leaves very little room for being able to actually, you know, properly fill out your sheets so that you don't need to rely on the internet or, or a phone or something. 
Um, I'm sure that there are going to be deluxe editions of each of the different uh, classes released by Paizo at some point or another, and I believe that there are going to be fans who are going to release their own custom character sheets as well. So I'm not too too worried about that. I think it's definitely going to be uh, something to look forward to, something that's going to happen, uh, so I'm not stressing about it. All right. Now, um, one of the other things that, as a GM, I look for whenever I play role-playing games is what is the difficulty challenge? What is the growth of my game? How fast is my party going to level? How strong are the monsters in my game? So, I've got to say this. I've never been a fan of experience before. Never have. I, I generally avoid it if I can. But the idea that 1,000 XP, that's it, 1,000 XP is what you need to level up and the experience you gain from fighting any of the creatures or having any of the encounters is relative to your character and the difference in your level between the, your level and the scenario is genius. It's absolute genius because it means that there is always a steady and constant rate of leveling up. It means you're not going to level up in a game at level 1, but at the same time you're not going to level up in 30 games at level 19. It's, I mean, it's one of those things that have always bugged me. It's like this this exponential growth to trying to reach a certain um, level. It's now going to be at a point where everything is paced out. The time it takes for you to level from level 1 to level 2 should I ideally be the same time it takes for you to level from level 19 to level 20. Um, it shows a really, really good idea that has come into fruition from what I think is a lot of struggles from a lot of GMs. I'm glad that they listen to people about this this problem, and I'm glad that there is a solution. I hope to actually try it and really be able to stand by it, but I have not yet, so I'm not going to sort of say, oh, it's going to be fantastic, but I'm saying it sounds fantastic. Um, speaking of the encounters, of course, we are now going to talk very briefly about the bestiary. Uh, the bestiary filled and chock full of great, great monsters, beautiful artwork. The cover art by far is my favorite fantasy artwork at the moment. Uh, it uh, The Hydra is, is like gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. And... Um, and honestly, I think the most interesting thing about the bestiary for me was the fact that they started to add in different categories. Uh, the different categories now representing a number of different creatures, such as the rock worms that include the purple worm, the uh, crimson worm, etc. And you also have categories that expand via classes, such as the deep gnome, which now have the deep gnome scout, the deep gnome warrior, the deep gnome rock warden. These versatility, uh, sorry, this um, versatile amount of creatures and encounters means that as a GM, I don't need to go away and start piecing together aspects to make unique monsters. They're there already, and I can look at expanding on what's there. Uh, it's a re reasonably sized book with a whole bunch of def uh, of really, really cool and well-defined fantasy-based monsters and creatures. Um, I, I definitely did enjoy the bestiary, hands down. The only thing I was a little disappointed about was the fact that it doesn't have a character builder in it for monsters and creations. Oh, sorry, monsters and creatures. Uh, but Paizo has released a, uh, a document for you to download for free in terms of character building. If you want the character building stuff in Hardbook, uh, it'll be released for the Game Mastery Guide. So that'll be, you know, later on, which I, I will definitely get and I will highly, highly recommend. Um, so yes, monsters, a lot of fun, very cool. Probably the only thing I would say as a negative is a lot of the monsters in the bestiary have been renamed and relabeled. I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I get why, you know, you do that. But uh, let me give you an example. Um, I'm sorry, I'm actually pouring through this right now. So uh, let's look at the... Something nice and easy. No, you're still there. You're still there. Bum, 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 bum. You know, I say, yeah, here we go. The Sturge. Great example. The Sturge is something I think is very iconic. We know what a Sturge is when we say a Sturge. It's this tiny mosquito with bat-like wings. In uh, the new edition, they're calling them Blood Seekers. I mean, I get it, right? They're Blood Seekers. That way, when you talk about them, you don't need to describe them. Several giant flapping Blood Seekers head towards you. Makes sense. But I feel like you know, you don't need to dumb down stuff for, you know, your audience. You don't need to kind of make those name changes because at the end of the day, it's like, yeah, we know what Sturges are. Sturges have been around for ages. They're, they're, they're solid. We get them. Um, you know, that type of thing. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's another example I can, I can use. No, no. 
No. I mean, there's there's more, but, you know, uh, it's just about finding them. Because they're all renamed, of course. Which is cool, but, you know, again. Oh, yes, the Zwerf Neblin, as I mentioned before. Uh, instead of the Zwerf Neblin, or Zwerf Neblin, as they're pronounced, uh, they're now called the Deep Gnomes. So, again, another example of that. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's probably my only criticism about the bestiary. All right, the last book I want to talk about is, of course, the Lost, um, the Lost Omens World Guide. Now, the Pathfinder setting is a very rich one, one that is filled with such great lore, and one of the things that I love more than anything is being able to play in a world that has a history. This book here gives you that history. If you just want to know about the basics of the world, there's a chapter at the end of the core rulebook that will cover that. But if you, like me, are really into kind of the meat and potatoes of trying to understand like a setting and really delve into and pull apart like all the parts of the world, then the book is for you. It'll cover not only the factions, the people, the religions, the, the different nations within the different kingdoms. It'll also give you a timeline so that you have a solid history of all the different areas within Galarian. So this book here is definitely a must-have. Even if you're not playing 2nd Edition, if you're playing 1st Ed, get this book. Pick it up because it covers pretty much everything uh, before and after the events of the Tyrant's Grasp Adventure Path. So, um, yeah, very, very happy and very excited for this one. All right, so in total, to, to surmise, um, I think this RPG is definitely something that I'm going to be playing at my tables. Will it mean that I'm going to give up first ed? No. At, at no point will I give up first edition Pathfinder. First edition Pathfinder is very special to me, and I do not see any point in my life where I will not be playing at least one game of it. But this being said, given time, I can imagine a lot of my tables converting to second ed. There is a lot of things that have been made a lot easier. As a GM, there's a lot more stuff that, for me, just speaks to that whole element of prioritizing role play and adventure over simple numbers and trying to boost them up. So, in a lot of ways, I think it, it captures my spirit as a game master uh, a lot more than I think uh, the first edition did. But, as always, I'm a big fan of character building. And I'm waiting for way more options before I throw myself headfirst into the full experience of second edition. Would I play it again? Again, absolutely. Would absolutely wholeheartedly play this game if anyone invited me to play it. It's a, a, a given. Would I recommend it to other people? Totally. Absolutely would recommend that people play this game. Even if you um, are someone who is firmly in the one e, one -e bed, play second ed. Just play it. Just try it. Have a good time. Uh, the worst case scenario is you have a good game. The best, uh, the you know, other case scenario, you find that maybe it's more your speed and something that you want to play. Um, overall, I think this game is something that you should definitely experience firsthand, and not listen to the uh, the ramblings of some strange Australian bloke who's sharing his thoughts and opinions on a public forum. So, um, yeah, that's that's my opinion. That's my opinion, that's my thought, and I hope that it's at least guided you along the journey that I've taken towards deciding that I am going to be playing Pathfinder 2nd Ed, uh, even though I am still very biased towards 1st Edition. And uh, if you, like me, have some thoughts or opinions that you want to share or get off your chest, leave them in the comments below. Let me know. I love chatting with people about um, the same opinions as mine or even completely different ones. Uh, of course, if you did enjoy this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, go follow us on all of our different medias in the description below, and till we meet next time, guys, game hard, or die trying. Bye!